It's good to be with you this morning and share with you the next part of our Life in the Spirit series. I already sense God is speaking to many of you during our worship time this morning and through that, that item. Pastor Bill kicked us off last week talking about welcoming the Spirit into our lives, uh, who the Holy Spirit is, how we uh, receive Him. And I'm going to build on that uh, this week. How many of you ever had uh, a bad day? We all have bad days, don't we? Can I share with you one that I, um, I look back on and have a bit of a laugh now, but it wasn't so good at the time. I was, uh, I was at home in one morning. I was trying to finish some work before I had to leave, and I was running late. Um, a, a good way to start off a bad day is running late. And, uh, and so I kind of bundled my stuff into the car. Um, I had to drive to a train station and catch a train. And as I pulled up, the train was just getting into the station. So I'm kind of, I'm a bit frantic. And, uh, and so as I'm running towards the train, I got about a meter away from getting onto the train. And something hit me on the neck, right? And I'm trying to flick it away. I thought it was like a leaf or a rubbish or something. I don't know what it was. Then I felt something dig into my neck. And I'm trying to pull it off. And it won't come. And eventually I, I get off and I just see this black and yellow thing go flying away. I don't actually know what it was. And so, not wanting to be late, I got onto the train, right? And I punched my ticket and I sat down and then it started. I could feel heat rising up. I was like red. I was sweating. My heart started racing hugely. And I thought, this is it. I've been bitten by a European wasp, and I'm going to die on a train. <laughs> now, obviously, I didn't die on a train because I'm still here. Um, I got to where I was, was going, and I got off, and I looked for the first kind of official-looking person I could and just said, look, I think I've been bitten by a wasp. Is there a first aid uh, person around? And so then I sat and I waited for, I don't know, what seemed like ages. It was probably only a couple of minutes. And then this uh, elderly gentleman came over to me. He's holding his little first aid kit. And he plonks it down next to me, doesn't say a word, doesn't say hello or anything, just opens up the kit and he gets out a first aid booklet. <laughs> it doesn't inspire a huge amount of confidence, right? So... He starts flicking through the booklet. Still has not said anything to me yet. He goes, are you allergic to anything? I was like, no. Hmm. Goes back to flicking through the booklet. He gets to the end of the booklet, puts it back in the case, and says, well, we can't do anything for you just in case you are allergic. Um, there is a hospital about 10 minutes down the road if you're really worried, if you want to wander down there. How many of you know... I have stopped worrying about this pain in the neck, right? And I am now consumed with rage for the pain in the neck that is standing in front of me, right? <laughs> I was so overwhelmed by this chain of events. Do you know what I did? I got on the train and went back home again. <laughs> We're talking this morning about walking uh, with the Spirit. Now, I think it's easy to walk with the Spirit when things are going well. When life is going well uh, and, and things are happening, it's easy to walk with the Spirit. And if you have a, an off bad day, a little bit like I did, well, you can bounce back. But what about when bad days turn into bad weeks and bad weeks turn into rough, long months? I'm now talking about life circumstances that just don't seem as if there is light at the end of the tunnel and there's no relief in sight and you don't feel like sometimes that you've got the strength to carry on. Who remembers when they were in school learning about the explorers, Burke and Wills? Do you remember about learning about Burke and Wills in school? Famous explorers, Australian explorers, and we used to study them and, and revere them as these courageous pioneers. But certainly in primary school, we used to gloss over the fact that actually their expedition was a failure. And just to refresh your memory, 
They thought they had everything they needed for, to make the first trip from Melbourne in 1860, from Melbourne all the way up to the Gulf of Carpentaria at the top of Queensland and back down again, and to be the first uh, non-Aboriginal people to do this. The Aboriginal people knew that stretch of land very well. So the expedition was plagued with trouble from the beginning. They set off in the winter time for some reason, and so it was one problem after another. Bad weather, there were lots of hold-ups, the food provisions dried up, the camels that they took with them eventually died because there was nothing left for them to uh, eat and they didn't know where to get water. They came back down to a place called Cooper's Creek, and um, their support team who had been there just a few hours beforehand decided they're not coming back, we're, we're moving back home. The support team left there. And so when Burke and Wills got back there, they're like, we don't have any food. We don't know where to get water from. The local Aboriginal people there started to help them out. I think there was probably some communication issues, but um, they started to provide them with food and, and the kind of things that they could eat. And slowly they were getting renourished and getting their strength back until Burke very foolishly scared off the Aboriginal people one day. He shot his pistol and they freaked out and took off. And within a few weeks, uh, both of them died out there. We don't want our spiritual life to be like that, where we're parched and we're drained for months on end and we're relying to be fed by other people in our spiritual life. Our spiritual life is one of the first things that come under attack when we're going through a tough time. You might be able to relate to this. Have you ever thought, with all the distractions in my life, I've got so much stuff going on and I just, oh, I couldn't find the time to, to sit down and pray or I couldn't find time to, to read my Bible or I, eventually I, I can't find time to, to make it to church each week on a Sunday. I'm very conscious that there are all sorts of distractions that can get in the way of us walking with Jesus and pursuing our spiritual walk on a daily basis. So that's what we're talking about this morning. How do we keep walking with the Spirit through good times or bad? How do we keep walking with the Spirit? There's two principles um, I want to share with you this morning from a passage that I read many years ago. It's been a great encourage, uh, encouragement to me. If you've got a Bible there or a Bible app, um, you want to flick over to Isaiah chapter 43. And if you don't have one, uh, the verses will be up here on the screen. Isaiah was a prophet who lived some 700 years before uh, Jesus was around. And um, I like to picture him when he wrote uh, down some of his prophecies. He was probably older in years. And so he was, I like to picture him kind of stretched out before God, just praying, waiting, listening. And then he would get up and write down these prophecies. I don't think he knew uh, or understood what he was writing most of the time. Some of it was probably a bit strange to him. The people around him who probably heard the prophecies um, were probably even less favorable about it because the first half of, of the book of Isaiah, as we know it now, uh, was all about woes and pointing out the error and, and sins of, of the people there at the time. And so, uh, but the second half is all about blessing. And hope, and it's about the promise of a coming Messiah. That's why we call um, Isaiah one of the messianic prophets, because there's so many uh, passages that refer to Jesus uh, coming. And I love this passage. This is, comes from the second half, which is a great encouragement. And I want to read to you verse uh, 1 and 2 to begin with. He says, But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel... And these are four great promises in this one little verse. Do not fear. I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Even just that to dwell on when you're going through tough times are great reminders. Do not fear. I have redeemed you. We were purchased with a price when Jesus died on the cross. He's summoned us by name. He knows us by name and we belong to God. He goes on, verse 2, when you pass through the waters, 
I'll be with you. When you feel like you're going through storms, he says, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they won't sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. How many of you sometimes feel like you're, you're walking through fire when the circumstances are a bit hot? But he promises, I will be there with you. You won't be consumed in it. And then he goes on uh, um, like that. And then we come down to verse 19. And this is what I want to share with you from uh, this morning. Verse 19. He starts off, see, I'm doing a new thing. Reminds me of when, uh, where Paul says in 2 Corinthians, the old is gone, the new has come. If Christ is in uh, any man, any woman, then they are a new creation in him. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? You know, when you're going through tough times, it's very hard. Sometimes we focus on what's happening in the natural. We look at the circumstances around us and we despair. Because it can be overwhelming sometimes. But what does it say here? Do you not perceive in the spiritual what is happening? I am with you. I am making a way. And then this little bit here, and this is what I want to open up this morning. He says, I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Two powerful promises we're going to unpack this morning. The first thing, he is making a way in the wilderness. Now we can interpret wilderness in a couple of different ways. Um, we might think of worldly wilderness. We look at our world around us and it can feel like a spiritual wilderness. It reminds us of what a world without Jesus is like. The sin, temptation in what can appear sometimes like an increasingly uh, secularized society. You only have to watch the news for a couple of minutes and see some of the terrible things uh, that are taking place. The attacks in London over the last two weeks. Just awful to, to watch those things on TV. On top of that, there might be the moral and ethical failure of world leaders. I look at what's happening in the Philippines at the moment, and I despair for that country. Or, or North Korea, many other places. And it becomes overwhelming almost. You look and, and you can feel like you're without hope and can leave you very cynical and bitter if you don't have that hope in Jesus. I've had conversations with people who are just despairing and saying, I don't know what's happening. The world must be coming to an end. I don't understand it all. And actually, we forget that a lot of these things are not new. That if you look throughout history, uh, there has always been evil. There's always been sin. There's always been temptation in our world. How much more do we need to pray, Lord, let your kingdom come? We need to be focused as Christians. So there's a worldly wilderness around us. But you might also interpret that as a personal wilderness. What a life without Jesus or without his spirit is like. Maybe it's a personal wilderness that you're going through. A relationship breakdown. A significant trauma. Maybe it's a financial struggle. Just life circumstances that stop us in our tracks and make us feel like there's no way out. I would say that uh, in my life to date, I've probably been through two significant wildernesses. Probably lots of other minor ones, but, but two significant ones. And one was in my teenage years. Um, during high school, there was a relationship breakdown with some of my friends. And, uh, and there was a period of about six months there, which was a real struggle, quite uh, difficult. Um, the other was a, a personal trauma that lasted longer during my mid uh, during my mid twenties, and that was probably over a couple of years, I reckon. And that was largely because I mean I allowed myself to decline spiritually. I was not pursuing God, and um, and so coming through that took me a lot longer. And when you're in the middle 
of a wilderness. It hurts. You feel like no one else understands what you're going through or that there's no way out. I know. I've been there and many of you have as well. Um, and now I count it a privilege that when I walk with people through the tough times they're going through to see how Jesus starts to work in them because it's, it's nothing that I can do, but it is him at work in their life and, uh, and the spirit enabling that transformation. A couple of things we need to know about Jesus. He, he has made a way. He made a way when he died on the cross and was resurrected. Have a look at the scripture from uh, Galatians chapter 5. It says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. In other words, don't be tempted to chuck in the towel and give in. But as we keep walking with the Spirit, we're strengthened to pull through. Um, then Paul goes on in this letter to list off a whole lot of you know, what the desires of the flesh are. And then coming down to verse 22, he contrasts that with the fruit of the Spirit. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the evidence of the Spirit at work in our life. Against such things there's no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. This is a reminder that Christ was crucified so that our sins would be crucified along with him and so that we could receive the Holy Spirit and experience that transformative fruit at work in our life. Not only has Jesus made a way, but he is making a way in whatever it is that you might be facing. And friends, perseverance is the key. Learning to never give up, never give up, never give up. There is an old saying, if you're going through hell, don't stop. Just keep walking, keep moving, because you will get through uh, what you're facing. Here's a few, few scriptures on, uh, on perseverance that are a great encouragement to me. James chapter 1, and verse 12 says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And then again in chapter 5, James says, as you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord's full of compassion and mercy. Most Many of you would know the story of Job who, who lost everything, his family, his property, his dignity, his health, and, uh, and God restored all those things back to him uh, abundantly because he was uh, faithful in persevering. And Romans chapter 5, this is my, my favorite on perseverance because there's so much in here, says, we also glory in our sufferings. Now, nobody enjoys suffering, do they? It's not something we look forward to. But what is he saying here? When, when we do suffer, particularly because we know we are where God wants us, God does uphold us and he carries us through those times. We glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. When you go through a tough time, there's really two things that happen. Either you just kind of fall flat and go, eh, I, can't, I can't move on, I give in. Or there's an inner resolve to say, you know what? I'm not going to let this get the better of me. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. Persevere. Suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. What is character? Character is the kind of person you are that, that is revealed under pressure. And so when you go through these tough times and, and you enable yourself with the Spirit of God to persevere, your character is revealed. 
So perseverance produces character and character produces hope. Hope to make it through. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And this is the second point I want to make today. Some Christians are very happy to accept that, yep, God is making a way out. Jesus is making a way out. I accept that. And when I get out of it, then I can be spiritual again. Nonsense. You can experience the Spirit of God right now, right where you are, whether you're going through good times or bad times. He is pouring streams of living water into your wasteland. Sometimes we're hanging out for the next spiritual experience and we're relying on those around us to feed us and prop us up in between. But the best scenario is learning the discipline of leaning into God ourselves and receiving from His Spirit daily as we read the Word, as we pray. Sometimes you might find that overwhelming. I've said to people, you know what? Listen to podcasts of good preaching. At least then you're getting the Scripture and good interpretation on the inside and you're, and you're hearing from God. In John chapter 4, Jesus spoke to a Samaritan woman by a well where he asks her for a drink. But in actual fact, he was about to offer her so much more. In verse 13, Jesus says, this is having this conversation with the woman at the well. He says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Pastor Phil and I were talking in between the services and he came up to me and said, Oh, Lathan, I love that story from, from John chapter 4. He said, Isn't it good that we don't have to walk to the well anymore? We've got it with us all the time. We have a well, uh, a water welling up to us that leads to eternal life. You see, his spirit is that constant stream of nourishment and refreshing. Can you imagine what it was like for this woman who had struggled all of her life from one unsatisfying, dysfunctional relationship to the next? And in a moment, she receives that wellspring of life. She goes from that place and she says, you guys are going to come, come and see this man who's told me all about my life and everything I ever did. And you can experience that too. The Holy Spirit is not some far-off acquaintance who pops in to visit every now and then. He's with us day by day. He's with us now. That's why you and I can operate the gifts of the Spirit. Did you know that? You can actually operate gifts of the Spirit. If you've been baptized in the Spirit, if you've had that, that gift of speaking in tongues... But sometimes people think, oh, no, well, maybe that's just for pastors and leaders being all deep and, and spiritual. No, those things are there for our empowering, our strengthening. Maybe it's about making a decision about your future. Expect God's guidance and the faith to believe that he has that under control. Parents, I felt this one really strong. Parents, um, you can... Expect God to give you wisdom and knowledge to speak to your kids, particularly if you're despairing over um, circumstances with your children. Maybe it's in the workplace. Maybe you need a gift of discernment about how to handle a an issue in the workplace. Or maybe you've got loved ones who are sick. Pray, expect healing, step out in faith. You can operate those gifts that are listed in 1 Corinthians 12. It's crucial that we make space for the Spirit in our life and that we have that reserve to draw on. That's why we need that well, that spring of water in us that's the Holy Spirit. We have to thirst after God. Have a look at this psalm. I love this beautiful psalm. Psalm 42. It says, As the deer pants for water, for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? Let me ask you this. What exactly do you think a soul that thirsts for God looks like? Well, maybe it's something like this. 
a soul that puts itself aside and desires only what God wants. A soul that pursues God no matter what the cost, no matter the obstacle. A soul that doesn't look to be spiritually sustained by the world around it, but only by God's Holy Spirit. And a soul that drinks from God's Word and His Spirit daily. The Holy Spirit walks closer than a friend. And he epitomizes Jesus' words when Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, come to me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I'm gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. There are some of you here this morning, you feel like you're in need of some rest in your soul. You're feeling weary. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There are some days where you don't feel like facing the pain in the neck and you want to get on the train and go back home again. I want to encourage you this morning, whatever it is you're going through, don't give up. Hang in there. Persevere. Draw strength from his spirit and draw him close and he will draw close to you.